So, you know, Mike got to do it for the Ville. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He got to do it for all of us that love him and we want to see him prosper. You know what I mean? It not tarnish his legacy by getting knocked out by a big mouth kid like Jake Paul. Right. <laughs> I don't see it happening. I think, I, I don't know if you guys saw the workout videos, but Tyson looks good in the ring. So I want to see this man take it to him. I don't want I don't want anybody to get hurt. Let me just say that right there. I want to see Jake get hurt. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want that, man. That's not me. Not That's, like critically. Not, not, oh, okay. not, not critically. No, no, I don't want that. I just want him to get a, yeah. a black eye. Not, not <laughs> no physical damage, but I want him with a big black eye. And maybe, maybe knock out one, two. <laughs> okay. Bam, 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 bam. Welcome to another episode. Why are you shaking your head? You don't like my... Bam, 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 bam. My bam, 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 bam. I'm your guy, Roddy Rikai. Welcome to another episode of The Fumble. Samaria, how you feeling today? I'm feeling good because we have a great episode for you guys today. Two special guests coming on to talk a little boxing, a little UFC yeah, it's a lot of action going on. I'm happy. You know what I'm saying? I want to get some aggression off. You feel me? Like, ugh, I might go to the dojo and throw some. Hey, yeah! Let's let's talk about some sports things. Let's let's yeah, do it. Let's, let's get into the show. <laughs> All right, Rodney. It's another tough week for the Dallas Cowboys from CeeDee Lamb and the sun beaming in his face inside of AT&T Stadium. Jerry Jones said he's not doing nothing about it. To Micah Parsons saying that head coach Mike McCarthy doesn't work as hard as the players in the locker room. It's clear, though, that the Dallas Cowboys will be looking for a fresh start next season. Now, should they go out and get Deion Sanders? Now, Coach Prime says that he has no interest in coaching for the Cowboys. But Rodney, if the job is offered, should he take it? Hell no. Who the hell want to work on a plantation? Uh-uh-uh. No, sir. No, sir. You cannot be a head coach under this iteration of the Jones family. I'm sorry. It's just a recipe for disaster. I don't know that Dion will stay at Colorado. I don't know why you would if your sons aren't going to be there and Travis Hunter isn't going to be there. So maybe there's an opportunity to go uh, down to Florida State, maybe, you know, um, and there's some other programs that will have some openings that I think would be a lot more enticing. I think what Dion does well bodes well for the collegiate athlete i don't know how it translates to professional athletes right um his, his motivational style when there's millions and millions of dollars and there's a lot more ego i, I don't know how even as, as great as dion is and as as magnetic as his personality is i don't know how professional athletes are going to feel about some of the things that he says especially publicly about them because that's been his motivating factor a lot of times so yeah especially with like Valerie cap and he's not able to just go out and get who he wants. Yeah. I, I could see him going to an NFL team, especially if his son is going to be drafted there, because this would be the first time that Deion Sanders is not coaching his kids. And I would not be surprised if he was one, not at Colorado next season, but two at an NFL team, whether it's the giants or the Cowboys somewhere that he could wiggle his way in there to draft Shador Sanders. I'm serious. I could see it. Let, I okay, really wait. don't. How do you think that know. Coach Prime is going to be without his sons? That's what I'm know. trying to think about. He's never done that. He hasn't, but I'm I'm close to being an empty nester myself, right? And I have to figure out what my next identity is. No, no, seriously. It's like a real thing. Like, people don't tell you what it's like when your kids are gone and that how painful it is. So I understand his desire to stay connected with them throughout their collegiate experience. But to take to take that connection to their professional lives, I think would be incredibly challenging, not just for Dion, but also for his kids. Also, ain't no way in hell the New York football giants are drafting a black quarterback. That's not going to happen. So we can or have a black that. head coach for that. Right? That is not going. That's why I'm no longer a Giants fan. There's just and there's a little bit of an implicit bias that they have, and they don't really rock with black quarterbacks like that. There's only one black quarterback that has ever won a game for the New York football Giants, and that was just last year. So we, we can scrap that. Again, uh, Dion is not even a quarterback coach. You know, like he, he can be maybe brought on as like a special outside counsel, but to be the head coach of an NFL franchise, I just don't see it. He, he's, a, he's a motivator. He's a phenomenal orator, but head coach? Yeah. Yes. Nah. He's a great leader of men. That's what I would call him. Um, but right, he would have to create like he's been doing. He he curates this coaching staff around him that kind of picks up where he lacks. And it's been working because what he's been able to do in Colorado, I was not expecting them to have a shot at 
not only winning yeah. their conference, but getting a, a spot in the playoffs. That's oh, yeah. crazy. Yeah. They're seven and are they seven and two right now or something seven like that? Two. Seven and, and two. With two Heisman candidates. See? I think yeah. I feel like an NFL team is gonna call. He may not go, but they're gonna call. Now, sure. what I will tell you is Warren Sapp. Warren Sapp has definitely elevated his profile. That D line for yeah. Colorado has been phenomenal this season. Mm -hmm. It started off a little bit shaky, but they are rocking and rolling. And you know, Warren Sapp has some things uh, in his personal life yeah. that made him kind of a pariah. I think that his his um, his insertion into Colorado's locker room has really, really validated that D line. And I can see teams around the NFL reaching out to him to fix uh, to fix their D line. So maybe not Dion being the head coach or central figure, but there's a lot of people uh, a part of that that coaching mm -hmm. uh, that coaching team who I think mm -hmm. are are high level candidates for other jobs for sure. Yeah, and I would love to see him go out and and do something because, he, like you just mentioned, he's had. A little trouble um, before he got the call from Colorado. And this is really, like he says, it's been like a rebirth, I guess, for him to yeah. be around these kids. And that gets him up every day. So that's always a great story. So I would definitely love to see him if he wants to go to the NFL realm. I think that they would welcome him. Now, earlier this year, you said that you didn't think Shador was going to be like a top five pick. Are we still standing I on that? I swear I said that. I did say that. You did say I that. I did say are that. You, I did. I did. Based off of last season, but now he could go depending on what, depending on who the teams are. What, what do you mean? Because you know, because you know that Prime said that he can't go and and play anywhere. Because okay. I know a well, lot of people want the the Titans to draft him or the Raiders, and they would have to have a top five pick. Like if he had came out this past year. Mm -hmm where it was a more quarterback heavy draft. It's it, not was a it lot though? of Do we uh, how many quarterbacks I mean, we do you talk see about them the every league? week? Caleb but Williams. How many of them in? They're talking about benching Caleb Williams. <laughs> I'm saying You're he talking about out. benching him. I'm no no no. Tell me about the people who are who are performing well, not just names. Well, Drake May Drake May has won two games or one. Oh. oh okay. And 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 Washington looks great. Bo Nix. Bo Nix has been playing decent. Bo Nix is but, good. Bo Nix is good. But I think Shador, outside of Jaden, I don't. I think that Shador would have been the second best rookie quarterback this year. I get that, but I don't know if a team would have given him a shot that high. I think that this season really helped him. Okay. I really we do. I think that they have a better offensive line. He looks more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he has more time working with Travis Hunter, so their connection is great. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how it translates. Easy lead. We are going to see. And he's also not going to have his dad either. So we'll see how that works. Because okay. he's had his dad since high school. Oh. Well, you let us know down in the comments. What do you think about the Dallas Cowboys possibly going out and getting Coach Prime? Do you feel like that's a good move for him? Should he stay at Colorado? All of these possibilities, especially after the great season that they're having. Let us know down in the comments. All right, the NBA season is off to a sluggish start. In the Eastern Conference, only three teams are above 500 right now, and the amount of star players out with injuries is sky high. Despite that, though, there are several players playing absolutely out of their mind and have positioned themselves as leaders of the pack for MVP in the very, very early part of the season. I know, smart. <laughs> All right, first up, we got Steph Curry, who has the Warriors at 9-2. and two. He was absolute magic the other night against the Dallas Mavericks. Shea Gilgis-Alexander is averaging 30 for the best team in the West in the Oklahoma City Thunder. And the Joker is averaging an insane 30, 14, and 12 for the Nuggets. And Donovan Mitchell has the Cavs absolutely cooking. Uh, they are the lone remaining undefeated team in the league. So Samaria, in this way too early MVP poll, who do you think is playing the best to start this season? Oh, God. Like, the guys that you mentioned, uh, I I like to root for the underdog a little bit. I'm going to go Spider. I'm going to go Spider okay. Mitchell because I just feel like what Cleveland is doing right now, they've gotten huge wins over the Knicks. They beat the Bucks twice, the Sixers, the Warriors. Like you just mentioned, they're undefeated. I think he's averaging about 24 points a game. Darius Garland is back this season. So it's they just look like a well-oiled machine. I always be talking about that. And I feel like they are the team to beat in the East. Like, I, I'm like, oh my God, I'm I'm shooketh. I'm shooketh. It's <laughs> well, real early. 
It's real early. It's real early. They have a huge matchup next week against the Boston Celtics. You know, those are the two top teams really in the league. I also am aligned with Donovan Mitchell as my early season MVP. I don't think anybody foresaw the Cleveland Cavaliers coming out this hot. Um, Kenny Atkinson has done a phenomenal job in his first year with the team. Uh, Evan Mobley has been playing phenomenal basketball. There was a lot of conversation early on about whether or not him and Jared Allen could play together. Now we see that they can because Evan Mobley has developed his outside shot and they look really, really good. Darius Garland is absolutely cooking. And there was always this thing that people would say when it came to MVPs is you vote the best player on the best team. Not always hated it. I hated it. But in this instance, I will adopt that ideology just because I do want to see a fresh face um, holding that MVP trophy at the end of the year. You know, with all due respect to to the Joker, I don't want to see him win four MVPs. That puts him in a category in a stratosphere that I don't think is warranted quite yet. You know, I just I I don't think that that would be healthy historically for how we we review and regard his career. Um, That would put him damn near as, as a top five player of all time. I don't think anybody. Um, would regard him as such. It would. Four MVPs, a championship, finals MVP. Now, now we're talking about him like he's <laughs> like he's Steph Curry, you know? And I just, I don't want, I don't want that. I don't want, I don't want that. And it's not because he's white. People be thinking I'm racist. It's not because he's white. It's just because when I watch basketball, I recognize his greatness, but I don't revere and regard him as that level of talent. So. Well, speaking of Steph Curry, I, when is he going to get old? When is he going to age? When is his shot going to, it's not going to fall? Because, sir, what is going on? Like, please share your diet or your, like, what are you doing every day that you still look this good? It's crazy to me. Shoot or shoot. He'll he'll never never lose his jump shot. And I really do. I was going to mention John Morant, too, because I thought that he started off really hot as well. Like, oh, like, well, I don't know how long he's going to be out with this hip injury. Yep. But we talk about it all the time. He just he has that play style where he could get hurt at any given moment, and he did. Yeah, and you I know, hate. But that. but it has been it has been exciting to see him back on the floor. Yes. You know, there I don't know who I'm more excited to watch, him or Anthony Edwards. Like John Morant versus Anthony Edwards in terms of like entertainment value is. Yeah. You know, that'll be a, a hot debate for the next few years, assuming that they both can remain healthy. I feel really bad for Anthony Edwards, though. That Carl Anthony Towns trade is, man, so lopsided to start this season. Cat is playing phenomenally for yeah. the New York Knicks, and Julius Randle does not look like a good fit out there no. in Minnesota. Yeah. And um, I, I thought that Ant had a, the Ant's profile rate was, Ant's profile rose because of the success of the team. And his team is not what it used to be. And I fear, I do fear that um, the regression of his team is going gonna, is gonna to cause people to maybe hop off of the bandwagon. Because I don't think Ant is in a position to carry a team to the upper echelon of the Western Conference quite yet. So Yeah. And sometimes they just look sad. <laughs> they like, do. they don't look happy. Like, <laughs> Julia's just like... Yeah. Like just he has this hump in his he just mopes around. I'm like, I, yeah, it's a bad, it's it a bad guys. fit. I said it was yeah. a bad fit culturally. Like I just don't, I never, I don't, I didn't understand it. Why you would get rid of a, an elite stretch five like Cat for a plotting, not plotting, but like a a, a slasher non shooter like Julius Randle who doesn't defend well. It's just, it's just a bad fit. Um, so we shall see. But you know, I, I'm I'm excited for the season so far, despite all the injuries. It's too much. NBA players, can y'all drink some milk? We need to stop drinking almond milk. That's my suggestion. I think we gotta go back to the cow milk. We gotta get back to some whole milk two percent <laughs> or something, because these bones are brittle out here. They brittle as hell in the NBA. Come on, bro. Like half the league that I want to see just not playing. Oh, I'm pissed. Get some milk. Anyway. Y'all let us know your thoughts. Uh, who was your early season MVP to start the NBA season uh, between Steph Curry, SGA, the Joker, or Donovan Mitchell? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Now we'll get to the Mike Tyson, Jake Paul fight in just a few minutes, but that isn't the only big matchup happening this weekend. UFC 309 and the return of the reigning UFC heavyweight champion, John Jones. And here to help us break it all down is a member of the I1 Digital family. He is the men's editor for platforms like Cashes and Hip Hop Wired, but beyond the pen, he's also got 20 years of MMA training and amateur competition under his belt. So show some love for DL Chandler, Deal. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I uh, can't wait to get into this conversation. Yeah, yeah. You're, yo, are you a gamer? I'm a gamer. Yeah, I, I play <laughs> a little bit. I'm into NBA 2Ks, you know, COD, a little bit of that, you know, but I'm not oh. the greatest stuff. 
I don't know what gave it away. I just, you know, something. Like that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there's a hint here and there somewhere, you know. Got you, got you. So we got John Jones fighting this week. I, I, I already assume that John is going to win this this match. He's the greatest uh, mixed martial artist of all time. Um, and maybe the, the greatest fighter of all time. So forget this week. Do will we ever see a John Jones Francis Naganu fight, man? I would hope so because um, there are different leagues, as you know. So right. Naganu is at the PFL, which is a great league in itself. But the UFC would probably be, be the top banana in the MMA world. Um, who knows? Dana White might want to do some cross promotion one day and let Naganu and Jones get it on. I think that would be an amazing fight. Two big guys who can wrestle. And throw you no know, leather, it would be a, a heck of a fight. I would want to see it. Need to see it. You need, need to see it. Let's kind of go back to this weekend's fight. Um, how big is this matchup going to be for John in the legacy in, in his legacy? When we talk about legacy, you know, in 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 the MMA, MMA world, pardon me. Um, I think what John Jones represents, like you know, Rodney just said, he is pretty much considered the GOAT um of mixed martial arts, but also not just his division. As you remember, John Jones dominated the light heavyweight division in the yeah. UFC. He had no competition, so he had to move up to fight better, you know, fighters. And he ran into some guys who were, were tough, but he took care of them all easily. But when it comes to legacy, Stipe Miocic is a, to me, a great stand-up fighter, a great wrestler, a great champion. I mean, hey, he lost to Ngannou. He lost his belt to Ngannou. I mean, that's someone to lose to in the fourth round. So he took him to the fourth round. So Stipe is not a chump in that ring. And he is one of the more decorated UFC heavyweight champions. You know, I mean, this guy took out big names in the division. But for me, I think Jones has way too many weapons. But he also has a lot weighing on this fight, too. Jones had a lot of trouble outside the ring. We won't get into all of that. I mean, we all know the, the headlines. I mean, he wasn't the greatest guy outside the ring. But inside that ring, he was flawless. And he, he'll have to be against Stipe. And I think Stipe, to me, is his... I won't say it's a nemesis to him. I think there are better fighters uh, in that division who would be a bigger nemesis, in my opinion. However, I think what Stipe represents is a champion like John Jones who took them all on and wasn't afraid to fight anyone. And I think for his legacy, he has to win this thing to cement his legacy as the greatest of all time, as Dana White likes to proclaim him. Eh. It's like LeBron winning a championship this year. It's like, if he doesn't do it, are we really going to ding him? Not really, no. but I understand what you're saying. Also on 309 is a fight that I'm really looking forward to. We got Charles Oliveira and Michael Chandler. This, to me, is probably going to be the best match of the night. Chandler is tough. Like, he's he's one of the toughest dudes I've ever watched in UFC, so I'm always excited to see him fight, but Oliveira is a different kind of beast. Who do you have winning this match? Well, Do Bronx, as he's nicknamed Charles Oliveira, he's a a Brazilian jiu-jitsu player who likes mm -hmm. to stand and bang, you know, which is kind of different for a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu players because mostly they take the fight to the ground and they yeah. dominate with leg locks, neck cranks, and all that kind of thing. But Do Bronx, he likes to stand and bang. And I like, and, and Chandler, as we all know, also likes to stand and bang. You know what I mean? This is going to be a stand-up fight primarily. But let's remember, Chandler is also good on the ground too, and he doesn't get taken down easily. Yo, so those those kicks, those outside kicks of Oliveira, it'll be really interesting to see how Chandler offsets them because he is so short, right? He's right, like, right. He's like the Simone Biles of UFC. He's little, right. so he, he, you know what I mean? No, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, dang, that's short. Yeah. He's, he's little. <laughs> yes. And so Do Bronx, for me, he's a tall, lanky fighter. And also that makes him dangerous on the ground, too. When you have long limbs, you have a lot more options when it comes to submission grappling. You know what I mean? So... If it does get taken to the ground, Chandler could be in trouble with all those angles and all those holds that Charles does have in his bag. However, if it stands a bang, I don't know. They both have power. They both have heart. They both have grit. It's yeah. going to be a hell of a fight. To me, that's the fight I'm most excited about on the card. Same. And Oliver's coming off a loss, right? So yes, this he is. is yeah. A fight that he should have won, honestly. Um, so this will be interesting to see what kind of what kind of fire he comes out with. Um well, yeah, I, I agree yeah. with you. And I think he will because I think he has something to prove. This guy's a former champion. Uh Oliveira is not a chump, man. Like I said, I mean he's I another one of those guys who really has a resume that's worth remembering, worth praising. And it's gonna be to me my number one fight of the night after the Jones fight, seriously. So for novice UFC MMA fans out there, give us your top three to five figures who people may be sleeping on or are not familiar with. Oh, it's so hard, man, because, <laughs> I mean, there's so many fight divisions out there. There's one fight championship, which I love. 
which um, has a lot of disciplines like Thai boxing, which I come from. I was a Thai boxer for many years. Um, they also do submission grappling, which is straight submission, no strikes or anything. So one division has people like Stamp Fairtex, who is one of the fiercest women fighters out there. I mean, I'm talking like just an amazing blur of energy, power, finesse. So Stamp Fairtex, if, if you've never heard of her, go look her up. You're going to find a fighter that's going to like scare you at night. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but outside of one fight, let's go back to UFC. I mean, you have the champions like Ila Teporia. I mean, this guy just took care of Max Holloway, who, in my mind, is the toughest UFC fighter that's ever lived. This guy has a chin of stone. And Ila took him out. Ilya took him out. You know what I mean? Ilya, you know, he also took out Volk and all those other guys. You know what I mean? This is not a, again, this guy's a Spanish pit bull out there. You know what I mean? This guy's like one of the better fighters I've seen in that division in a very long time. So uh, Ilya Teporia is a guy to watch. I'll also say, take it back to the assassin baby, Brandon Moreno out of Mexico. Um, he's another great fighter, you know. And I think, too, you might mention, you might see that I'm mentioning a lot of the smaller fighters. That's what a fight is, man. I mean, let's just be honest, you know. Just the smaller fighters, the lighter weights, that's where the action is, you know what I mean? Only until you get to, like, light heavyweights where the fight slows down a bit. And I don't really see a lot of people in the light heavies beyond Alex Pierre, who is the champion right now. And Poetan, as you all know, has been taking out everyone. And right now, he might be the UFC's best pound for pound fighter, you know, to me. I think Alex Pierre at Poetan, hands of stone, is a top fighter in the UFC right now. He's the one to watch, too, as well. And hell, I'll say it right here Max Holloway is still dangerous. He might have just lost to Ilya Taporia, but he's still, to me, a guy who should have a belt around his waist pretty soon. That, and that's the difference between UFC and boxing, right? Like, just because mm -hmm. somebody takes an L in UFC, you're, you're, you're not a write-off. Whereas no, in boxing, right. a lot of times you take one L and it feels like your career is now on the downslide. Um, and so I am interested to see this this card. UFC 309 should be absolutely fantastic. Again, that Oliveira and, and, um, and Chandler fight is the one that I really got my eyes open for. And uh, we appreciate you, brother, because we, 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 I like this. I love UFC. I don't really get a lot of spaces and places to talk about it. So thank you for coming on here and even putting me on to some new cats. Yeah, Dio, thank you so much for coming on with us. And you all let us know down in the comments, what do you make of this weekend's UFC 309? All right, we've got another special treat for you today. Back for his second appearance, the heavyweight world champion himself, Shannon, let's go champ Briggs. This man, of course, needs no introduction but he's here to drop some insight on one of the most talked about fights coming up. Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul happening tonight. Y'all give it up for the legend, Shannon Briggs. What's up, champ? Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> Let's go, champ. Hey, guys. Hey, yeah, look at that New Jersey gloom back there. You're making me miss <laughs> oh, home. Man. Oh, man. <laughs> First and foremost, I want to thank you guys for having me on the show. Most definitely. Most definitely. You family at this point. Yeah. So what's up, guys? How, who who, who, who y'all got? First and foremost, who you got? Ooh. Well, <laughs> we gotta ask you that. I don't. Oh, I don't know. I'm gonna. I don't. I never want to go against Mike Tyson. Like I never want to root against him. So that's where I'm going. Okay. 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 As for myself. Yeah. Um. You know. Some. You know. I woke up this morning, and it hit me that Mike is 58 years old. You know. And if you remember correctly. When when uh, Holyfield took his loss, he was 58 years old. So I think that uh, can a 58 year old man beat a young kid? Damn, it's kind of you know. I never thought it gave that too much thought, you know. Yeah, you know, I feel like I'm never going to root against black people. First and foremost, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like after the last week, like, I ain't never going to. I ain't never choosing nobody over us. You dig me? I don't care how old you are. But but I was wondering, do you really feel like Tyson and Paul are gonna actually go at it? Is this more for show, or are they, are they coming for blood for real? Um. Well, I think that I think that Mike, if he doesn't, you know, uh, do what we want him to do, it's going it's going it's going to hurt his legacy. And I think that's what they want to do. They want to tarnish Mike's legacy for this kid to even want to beat up a, a you know old Mike Tyson makes me mad. You know, I, I have a relationship with these guys. I started these guys out in boxing. I trained them. I worked with them. You know, we used to talk about the possibilities, and here we are now. He's fighting Mike Tyson. Man, our life is amazing. But in regards to uh, Mike's legacy, this is this is bad. If he don't knock this kid out, if he doesn't hurt is him. Is it, though? Why is it bad? Yeah. If he doesn't... Because we're living in a time where... Um, you know, with the presidency and what's going on, it's, it's a nasty times, champ. And 
You know, it's nasty times, champ. And Mike gotta Mike gotta do us a favor. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Yeah, you know. That's too much pressure, man. Don't do that. Ah, we need it. It's real talk. <laughs> See, I'm curious, Shannon, how conflicted are you going to be watching this fight? Because you have relationships with both of them. Well, if you can see my shirt, my sweater. Yeah. <laughs> it's Brooke, no. That's Brownsville, Brooklyn. That's where we, me and Mike are both from. Mm -hmm. Brownsville, Brooklyn. The home of uh, Mike Tyson, Riddick Bowe, myself, Zab Judah, Eddie Mustafa Muhammad, Curtis Stevens, Danny Jacobs, and our new rising star, Bruce Carrington. So a lot of legends. Yeah, a lot of legends. One point eight miles in size. Only one point eight miles, not even two miles. So, you know, Mike gotta do it for the Ville. We you know yeah. what I'm saying? He gotta do it for all of us that love him and we wanna see him prosper. You know what I mean? And not just not financially, but not not so much prosper, but not tarnish his legacy by getting knocked out by a big mouth kid like Jake Paul. Right. <laughs> I don't see it happening. I think, I, I don't know if you guys saw the workout videos, but Tyson looks good in the ring. He still has the skills. He's still turning that hip. He's still slinging that leather. You know what I'm saying? That, that left hook is still strong. That jab is still is still crisp. You know what I mean? I mean, but also, and Shannon, you know this, you train the kid. Paul can throw it too. You know, he's not a bad fighter at all. He's great. He's great with the left. He's great with the right. He's got good slippage and all that kind of thing. But Mike Tyson is still Mike Tyson, man. You know what I mean? So I want to see this man take it to him i don't want i don't want anybody to get hurt let me just say that right there i love combat sports i love the fight game i don't like seeing fighters get hurt so i don't want tyson to get hurt i want to see jake get hurt oh <laughs> yeah. i don't want that man that's not me not that's, like critically not, not, okay. not, not critically no no i don't want that's why i'm gonna get a, yeah. a black eye not, not <laughs> no physical damage but i want him with a big black eye and maybe maybe knock out one two. <laughs> okay, yeah, that would be oh man, I would love that. Okay, um, I'm with that. One. Yeah. So Shannon, I'll reports are reports are that Jake is Jake's purse is forty million. Mike's is twenty million. You told us before we actually started this recording that you got a fight coming up. I was going to ask you what would it take to get you back in the ring, and would you ever be interested in fighting either Jake or his brother? Yeah, I want to. I'll knock them both out in the same night. <laughs> They could jump me, actually. They could jump me, and I, I knock them both out. Yeah, um, I like to, you know, I'm, I'm getting back in shape. I'm back in the gym. I'm feeling good. I'm looking good, man. Uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, fighting in March, and whoever is willing to put their name on the line, they better get a, they better get an ambulance ready. Let's just, go, champ. And just make sure that they make the fight near the hospital. Let's go, champ. <laughs> Hold on. Shannon, how old are you? I'm 52,000 years old. 52,000. 52,000. Look at me. All right, man. Look, win or lose, after your fight, you got to come back. Because, uh, you, you know, if you, if, you, if you do well, I want to give you praise. If you get your ass whooped, we're going to have to have a conversation. Nah. We're going to have to talk. Nah, champ, that ain't happening. Champ, ain't nobody whipping the champ ass. But um, I'm looking forward. To, I'm looking forward to the fight tomorrow night, as we all are. Yeah. And I want to thank you guys for having me on the best show, on uh, the best show on the internet right now. You got, you got a show. I appreciate. it. Let's, Let's, Let's go, Chad. Let's go, Chad. Thank you, man. Y'all get home safe. You know them Jersey uh, police officers will pull you over for nothing. So you already know. Y'all get home safe, G. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Peace and love. Hey, this can be an uncomfortable fumble of the week, but I'm going to try not to let it be. Okay. Last college women's basketball season, Samaria, Caitlin Clark had the sport by the throat. Iowa women's basketball was must-see TV, and if they were in a town, it was packed out in that arena, okay? The fan investment into Caitlin followed her to the WNBA, and viewership numbers for her games were sky high. Her mere presence alone helped several teams break attendance records, and in some instances, teams chose to actually move games to larger venues to accommodate the fanfare of Caitlin coming to town. Coming into this season, the biggest name in women's college basketball is unquestionably Juju Watkins. The star from USC is the front runner for player of the year, and her team is on a very short list of programs with a legitimate shot to win a title. Juju's game is absolutely cold. Currently, she's averaging 21, 7, and 5, and I mean no intent to sexualize her at all when I say this, but she is also drop-dead gorgeous. 
But none of that has translated into the kind of excitement and fan investment that Caitlyn had just a season ago. So listen up. In a Trojan home game in Juju's hometown of LA, a city with 4 million people in an arena with 10,000 capacity, only 3,000 people showed up. Iowa's preseason games last year had more fans than that. Now, granted, I recognize that it is very early in the season and their last two opponents were mid-majors, but it doesn't feel like the world and mainstream media has embraced her quite like it did Caitlyn. And so my fumble of the week is going to Juju Watkins fans who only support her online via tweets. Samaria, my question for you is, why does it feel like Juju isn't moving the needle the same way that Caitlyn did and does? Okay. Ooh, that's tough. I'm hearing this for the first time, guys. Um, I think for one, you got to remember that Caitlyn went to, they Iowa went pretty far both years that she mm. was, she had this stardom. So obviously she lost to LSU in the championship game and then she came back the next year and it was just crazy. She also had an antagonist right okay. in angel reese when she was playing and so i think that that allowed unfortunately and i hate that that allowed a lot of people to want to root for her and so i don't think that juju has that storyline so maybe she can get it i don't know like maybe i don't i mean race Ooh. plays a factor in it too i hate to go there but it does. i think that she just doesn't have that same storyline like everything lined up perfectly for Caitlyn to be this all-American superstar. For one, she's always on Sports Center because she's made some crazy shot. And for two, she lost in the championship game. Like I just mentioned, everybody remembers Angel, you know, talking about the ring. And that that that's a, that is a perfect storyline for people to eat it up. You're going to be on one side or the other. And I also think that just her fans rose to the occasion and they came out of the woodwork. So I do agree that Juju's fans should get fumbled the week because they need to stand up too. But I think nationally, maybe that's the reason why she's not getting, she doesn't have the level of stardom like Caitlin Clark did. Nationally, I, you know, I can understand it. You know, I wouldn't expect her to show up in Wisconsin and, you know, for mm -hmm. the fanfare to be what it was for Caitlin in Wisconsin. But in her city, in L.A., I would expect more of a raucous turnout for her games, regardless <laughs> of who she is playing against. And this is kind of why I always say, like, social media is not a real indicator of the real world because it's a terrible barometer to measure how someone is actually impacting things, right? Because if you go online, you'll see fanfare, and you'll see all of these things, but if it does not translate to actual butts and seats, if it does not actually translate to physical sales, then it's a farce. And sometimes in our community, we get so caught up in the bubble of what we see by our very curated algorithms that we think that what we are doing is of the utmost importance and is of the thing that most, that the masses, that the masses are aligned with. It's how, it's how the election last week was just decided. Right. Like nobody, by and large, in our community foresaw the election going quite that way. But because we were in this curated bubble, we had no understanding of the true impact and effect of what Donald Trump um, had on the rest of this country. And so a lot of the conversation around Caitlin last year was that, um, you know, she's not the only one. There's other people and Juju's going to be able to drive the same kind of. And it's, it's, it doesn't it doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen like that. And whiteness is so overwhelming. There's so many more white people in this country. And when they take an investment into somebody, they actually show up. And unfortunately, sometimes in our community, we have we do lip service and we do Twitter finger service, but we don't actually show up in a real meaningful way, in a way that is tangible, that, that, that creates tangible results for the person that we say that we love so much. Listen, I'm a fan. I love Juju. I see her sometimes around LA. I think she's spectacular. I think from a basketball standpoint, she's brilliant. Uh, she had a historical season last year. She'll probably have another one this year. Her team is phenomenal. They have some great transfers and some, yes. some freshmen that are coming in. And I hope mm -hmm. that she has all the success in the world. But there is something to be said about the fact that we are not showing up the way that we mm -hmm. be saying online that we are. And that's all I got to say. That's why the fans get the fumble of the week. You all let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. Is there something to be said about the way that black fans are showing up or not showing up for Juju rather, which is very different than the way white fans did for Caitlyn? Let us know your thoughts about this in the comment section. I am really interested to hear your perspectives.
Well, that's all for this week. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another great episode of The Fumble. Make sure to subscribe to The Fumble and at The Fumble Sports on all of our social media platforms. We deliver the latest in sports every day on our YouTube page with our homegirl, Jackie Ray, and every Friday right here at The Fumble with myself, Samaria Terry, and my co-host, Rodney Rakai. Yes. Pray for Mike Tyson. Pray for John Jones. You can't take another L, y'all. I'm scared. I, you can't I'm scared. Handle it. The community scared. cannot handle it. Mario, don't be scared. Don't be scared. Hey, we out of here, family. Peace.